Hi, welcome to the first part of uh, Tuesday Talks, August 2021. We didn't have any last year, and so we're excited that we can do it this year. Uh, we're going to start with uh, a little update on people here from Potomac. Uh, most people here are from Potomac. We had an issue in Potomac, the Baxendale Properties, and uh, Grace Road from the Board Conservation Trust is going to give us an update, so we know what's happening with that. And then we'll have John give his talk. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Grace Rowe, and I'm a trustee of the Board Conservation Trust. And um, a lot of you probably are donors, and I that way you're not doing um, And thank you, if you are. So we um, are trying to purchase a property in, on, the, on the Gansett Road that is the Animal Rescue League camp property. And it's 18 acres, and uh, it's costing $3 million. And it's um, a, a, just a, a beautiful spot where there's going to be nice trails, like everywhere else that we have around the village, and the whole town actually formed. We have over 300 acres. And the Warren Conservation Trust has been in operation since 1978 or so, um, and has accumulated that much property and done, a, and especially in this year of COVID, it's been greatly appreciated. The trails have been very well used. So I'm here to just tell you that um, we so far today have raised a million, which started in July. And we have an amazing, amazing, amazing grant, a matching grant of 500000 which is very generous. So I am here to answer any questions that you might have and just give you that short update before the presentation. Is the 500 in addition to the million? Some of the five, we just got the matching grant starting in the beginning of August. So we have, I could break it out, but I can't. <laughs> yes. It's funny you should give that little presentation. I was just talking to the gentleman today who lives in that area, but from North Town, very familiar with the property. And he told me that the town is going to get, or the trust is going to get 15 acres, and the owner is going to get three acres on the water side. Yes. We're 18 and he's three. He's okay. And um, the access, no, no. Our access that to um, to the water side comes off of um, over other grass grasslands, because the Warren Conservation Trust does own okay. half of the, that island. So you own half of it already? Yes. yes. Okay. We have for years. Okay. Um, we would love to get the other half, and we're working on it, but we haven't gotten anywhere. The grasslands? You're saying the access is via the grasslands? Yeah, Laura, you can get to the grasslands. You can walk out there. I know about that. I, mean, I live in the yellow house. I'm just asking. You have to get to, um, how do you get to where do you want to go from the grasslands? You go from those, is that what you're saying? There's a, at the end of the road, there's a path that goes all the way out. Oh, I know that. I mean, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about your acres here on the Gans Road. You weren't referring to that. No. no. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. No. Oh, sorry. The, 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 oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> the Magansett property has 18 acres. It's connected to, we have two little parcels that are tiny on Falmouth Avenue, and then the town has another section that's connected to that's four acres, yeah. but I think it's got a deep hole in the middle. <laughs> so we're hoping to have parking right there for those trails and maybe down by where they kept the animals. It's kind of called the OK Corral, which is at the far end, it's closest yeah. to yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? There's, I have, um, I have updated here in books for you out there, and trail guides. And then just as this, this is a sheet explaining the most thing, what's going on. And plus, Born Conservation Trust has a great website, and it's updated as fast as we can do it. <laughs> Hi, my name is David McLean, and uh, John is a friend of mine. We talked together for many years, and we stayed in contact. 
And so when I asked John if he would be willing to give a talk to the student house, he very enthusiastically said I would be happy to. And uh, I want to just give you a little bit of background about John because he's worked really hard to be where he is. And I think it's deserving that everybody knows what he's accomplished. And it's rather lengthy, so I'm going to abridge it. But um, let's see. John is a professor at Roger Williams. He's also taught at RISD. And he also taught at the University of Lincoln in the UK, uh, as well as the University of Connecticut and John Cabot University in Rome. He has written many books, 11, on architecture, aesthetics, philosophy, and psychoanalysis. He earned a PhD in architecture from Cornell. He's an architect, architectural historian, and um, he has, it's very difficult, I don't have very much light here, but so I'm going to go over here. And he's researched and written about a variety of architectures and philosophies for the purpose of suggesting alternatives to the practice of architecture and philosophy at the beginning of the 21st century. He has worked to define a theoretical approach to art and architecture based on philosophy, aesthetics, cosmology, psychoanalysis, and historical precedents, which can be applied to contemporary practice. He's worked to establish an intellectual basis for architecture and historiography and practice, means by which architecture can express cultural ideas. And he has researched and written about Egyptian, Greek, Roman, medieval, Renaissance, Baroque, early modern, modern, postmodern, and contemporary architecture. So he is well versed in many subjects, and um, uh, we've just been very good friends over the past 10 or 15 years, and we've talked together for probably about five years, and so I think this will be a very inspirational talk, and I'm sure you all will enjoy it and learn a great deal. I know that I will. Thanks, John. Does, does actually fits in well with what I'm teaching because I've been teaching a lot of American architecture and vernacular architecture classes in the last couple of years. So this was uh, actually right on my alley when uh, a lot of the other stuff that you mentioned. Uh, so I'm, I'm a great admirer of uh, what you've done here, the, the preservation society, the preservation work on building, the, the community activities, the, uh, the interest in the uh, one room school house, uh, I think are all uh, very uh, admirable. So I was happy to try to contribute to that. And I'm sure that everybody in this room knows a lot more about the Catalan school house than I do. So uh, I, I'm just going to try to maybe offer a perspective that, that, that's a little bit different. Uh, so I have to read from my paper. It's a lot of information I want to cram in. So, but it shouldn't take more than half an hour, 35 minutes. Uh, so hopefully there'll, there'll be some discussion afterwards. Uh, that's always good. And uh, I've been paying a lot to operate one side of the for me. These are very angry excited. So the talk is called The Significance of the Public Schoolhouse in American Architecture and Democracy. As you know, the Catawba Schoolhouse at 1200 County Road was built in 1894, 125 years ago. It took eight weeks to build for about $2,000. The design is credited to Carpenter Moses Waterhouse, and the construction is credited to James West. It served as a one-room schoolhouse until 1930, then as a community center until 1960. Classes were taught in reading, writing, arithmetic, science, nature studies, art, and music. Teachers were not allowed to be married. <laughs> I'm not married, so <laughs> <laughs> The building was restored to its original condition as a schoolhouse in 1999 by the Katamut Schoolhouse Preservation Group 
and has since been used as an educational and cultural center. In 2019, it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places and the Massachusetts Register of Historic Places. I would like to bring attention here to the significance of the architecture in relation to American history and democracy. The schoolhouse is a Cape Cod house with details connecting it to Greek Revival, shingle style, and Victorian architecture. The Cape Cod house is considered to be the iconic expression of the American house. It has a wood frame, a gable pitched roof for wind sheeting, a wooden shingled exterior with overlapping shingles, and a rectangular plan. The Katamak Schoolhouse also has Greek Revival and Victorian details, the pilasters or flattened columns at the corners connected to the tablature or horizontal board that runs below the roof, the pediment or triangular area on the front below the rich uh, pitch roof, and the Victorian bracket supporting the shed roof hoods, and the two separate doors were intended for use by male and female. Is everybody following me so far? Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, the slide. The column, the tablature, and pediment were structural elements of the ancient Greek temple. They were flattened and stripped of their structural bones and used as ornament by Catholic churches in Renaissance Italy, such as uh, this church, the Church of San Andrea in Mantua by Leo Battista Alberti in the Renaissance. Next slide. I have, I have a lot of pictures, so I'm going to go through the fast and curious. The ornamental details were first applied to secular buildings or houses by Andrea Palladio in the late Renaissance in Italy, as at, as at the Villa Rotunda. The Greek Revival style was a major part of neoclassical architecture, which dominated the 18th and 19th centuries in Europe and America. Sorry. From the beginning, when settlers first arrived in Plymouth in 1636, they brought with them advanced boat building techniques and carpentry tools. Wide plank floors were laid on runners placed on the ground, and oak frames were constructed, forming a skeleton of sills, quarter posts, and a roof plate. Vertical planks a foot or more in width were nailed to the frame, and shingles were nailed onto the planks. Roof planking was nailed to horizontal beams called purlins, connecting the triangulated trusses of the gable ends forming the pediments. Shingles or shakes were lapped on the roof. One of the most interesting early surviving Cape Cod houses is the Jethro Coffin House on Nantuck, shown here, built in 1686. It is covered with shingles and it is a salt box type house with a sloping, sloping pitched roof and timber framing. The device may have been invented to avoid British taxation of a second story. Next, next slide. Uh, Cape Cod is filled with examples of the Greek Cape type house, the colonial cottage with Greek revival details. Next. The Redwood Library in Newport, Rhode Island, is considered to be the first example of a building in the United States designed by a trained architect. Next. In 1747, a British shipbuilder named Peter Harrison used a pattern book for English villas to design a new library, now the oldest continuous library in the United States. Next. The library has two pediments in Greek Revival details, as copied from the pattern book, which was copied from a building in Renaissance Venice, Palladio's Church of San Giorgio Maggiore. Redwood Library was made by carpenters out of wood, so they mixed sand and paint to give it the feel of the original stone building of Venice. The Redwood Library was considered to be the first work of architecture in the United States, and Peter Harrison was called the first American architect, although he was neither American nor an architect. <laughs> he went to architecture school in England and had a collection of books on architecture. Harrison was a Tory during the war, supporting the King of England, and because of that, he was erased from history, although his architecture had a big influence on Thomas Jefferson, who visited Newport many times. Ironically, the Palladian style was mostly used by Whigs in England, wealthy landowners, as a symbol of opposition to the king, which is why it became so popular in the United States. Next. Is this the right one? I'm not going to 
The Great Kebab style was the dominant style of architecture throughout the 19th century, peaking right around the time of the Potomac Schoolhouse in 1894, during the period of history known as the American Renaissance, when America looked towards European precedents to form an identity. This included projects like the Agriculture Building at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893, just one year prior to the building of this building, by McKin, Mead, and White, the largest architectural firm in the country at the time. The Great Revival style symbolized American freedom and democracy and the roots of democracy and Greek ideals. Between 1890 and 1920, oh, uh, between 1890 and 1920, 30 of the 50 state capital buildings were constructed in the United States, all using Greek revival details, including the Rhode Island State House in Providence, begun in 1891 by McKinney and White. Next. The Columbia Exposition, also known as the White City, was America's introduction to the world stage in terms of commerce and industry, so America needed an identity based in European precedents and celebrating democracy and republicanism. Many architects practicing in Chicago at the time were unhappy with such a limited representation of American identity and were determined to create a new architecture that better represented America. Uh, these architects included Daniel Burnham, John Root, Henry Hudson Richardson, and Louis Sullivan, collectively known as the Chicago School of Architects, who contributed to the rebuilding of Chicago after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, the building of the Second City, and in so doing, created the new uniquely American architecture involving the bay window and the steel frame skyscraper, which laid the foundations for modern architecture. In 1898, the United States defeated Spain in the Spanish American War, a 10 week war which took place in Cuba, featuring the Rough Riders led by Teddy Roosevelt. One result of the war was the annexation of territories formerly owned by Spain, including Cuba and Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, and the Philippines and Guam and the Pacific, along with the Hawaii. The then president, William McKinley, was an expansionist, believing that the United States should insert itself into world affairs. After his assassination in 1901, President Roosevelt was an expansionist also, all of this can be seen as the beginning of the American Empire, which has dominated the world since, and which is tied to the identity created by the white city and the architecture representing democratic ideals. In nearby Rhode Island, the most prolific Greek revival architect was Russell Warren, who designed houses such as Linden Place in Bristol for the DeWolf family in 1810. Rhode Island has more Greek Revival architecture per capita than any other state. Unfortunately, most of the money for Greek Revival architecture came from the slave trade. The DeWolf family made more money from the slave trade than any other family in the country. Russell Warren, slide. Russell Warren relied heavily on pattern books, books with instructions and patterns for carpenters, especially those by Asher Benjamin, such as the American Builder's Companion. Though the details of the Katamic Schoolhouse are simple, they must have consulted pattern books for it. American carpenters did their best to carve the details in wood, although most of the time not very accurately. Their lack of accuracy was covered up by the belief that liberties taken with the details of ancient Greek architecture represented the freedom provided by democracy in America. So most Greek revival houses had very uh, inventive details. Next. A much earlier uh, colonial style Greek Revival house in Rhode Island was Whitehall, built by George Barclay in Middletown in 1729, a couple miles from Rhode Island. George Barclay was an Irish philosopher and priest who built the house while on furlough in Newport for a couple of years. Barclay is the father of idealist philosophy. He gave his name to Berkeley, California, and the Berkeley School of Theology at Yale which owns the house and operates it as a museum. It features pilasters and a pediment on the front. Slide. And on the back it is a salt box with a wall covered with shingles. Slide. 
1874, a photograph on the back of the house was taken by Charles McKim, the very first architectural photograph taken in the United States. <laughs> At the time, Charles McKim was working the architect Henry Hobson of Richardson, whose design for the Watts was a site. whose design for the Watts Sherman House in Newport in 1875 included an abundant use of shingles. The Watts Sherman House is considered to be the first example of the shingle style in architecture, the unique American style <coughs> celebrated the, celebrating the Arcadian wooden landscape, a romantic alternative to industrialization and domestication. The term shingle style was coined by Vincent Scully, Professor at Yale in 1955, Obviously, the shingle style can trace its roots back to the 17th century Cape Cod house. Slide. The Watt Sherman house is also in the Queen Anne style, a picturesque Victorian architecture featuring cantilevered pediment gables, overhanging eaves, patterned wood shingles, and Victorian brackets. The Watt Sherman stables, which currently serve as the residence of the president of Salve Regina University, were restored by Jeffrey Stantz, sitting there, a retired professor of architecture at Roger Williams University. Houses in Newport, designed by Jeff Stats, called the Three Little Sisters, feature the gable, eaves, shingles, and brackets of the Queen Anne style. Jeff is here tonight, as is Bob Dermany, a current professor of architecture at Roger Williams, operating in slide protection. <laughs> who uh, Bob gave a talk on Cape Cod Canal Bridges here at the Chicago School House in 2006. <coughs> Slides. Uh, Henry Hobson Richardson went on to develop this Richardsonian Romanesque architecture, beginning with Trinity Church in Boston the same year. Charles McKim went on to form McKim Meet at White, the firm that designed such iconic works as the Newport Casino in 1879, and Jeff worked his firm work on restoration of the casino also. We were just talking about that at dinner. Slide. And Isaac Bell House in 1882, both in Newport and both in the Shingle Style and Queen Anne Style. The Shingle Style and Queen Anne Style were connected to the arts and crafts movement in England, a romantic movement founded by William Morris at Comscott Manor in Oxfordshire. The arts and crafts movement rebelled against industrialization and capitalist production, which they saw as producing a polluted and sterile society. They favored the medieval guild system of production and medieval aesthetics, and were connected to the pre Raphaelite group of painters. The arts and crafts movement had widespread influence in the United States, for example, on the early work of McKim and White and Frank Lloyd Wright in Chicago. Wright designed his home and studio at Oak Park in 1889 in the shingle style inspired by the Isaac Bell House. As an arts and crafts architect, Wright insisted on designing every detail of the house and having every detail custom made and handcrafted. As a result, not many carpenters and mill workers would work with him. So you know what it's like to compromise, right? For one project, uh, Wright required his client to sign a contract stating that the wife could only wear clothing designed by Wright while in the house. Wright saw himself as designing people's lives, not just their houses. The painting Snap the Whip, painted by Winslow Homer in 1872, on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, depicts the one-room schoolhouse in relation to the pastoral countryside in the Adirondacks in the youthful game. After the Civil War, it was important to remember America as an Arcadia, a prehistorical pastoral paradise celebrated in ancient Greek mythology, a virgin landscape unstained by war and suffering, a landscape representing a utopian future. The Katana Schoolhouse, the one-room schoolhouse, the Cape Cod style, the Greek Revival style, and the Shingle style all, all represent the roots of American democracy. An important element of American democracy was its grassroots organization building from local communities. According to Thomas Jefferson, who used Greek Revival details for his architecture at the University of Virginia in 1819, education must be designed on the basis of democracy. 
Jefferson designed the university in Virginia around the library, which was placed in a rotunda, which is a half-scale copy of the Pantheon in Rome, because books were integral to an education. According to Jefferson, a good education would include natural history and natural philosophy, which includes uh, agriculture and chemistry. Other vital sciences would be mechanics, mathematics, botany, and geometry. Jefferson and the Founding Fathers were Latinists. The Constitution of the United States is largely based on the Constitution of the Roman Republic. Jefferson is sometimes called the Founding Father of Democratic Education. He was quoted as saying that an educated citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. He believed that education is the foundation of a democracy. Knowledge must be put in the hands of the people so that citizens can develop the capacity to govern themselves. Knowledge is thus necessary for effective self-government, and education and government cannot be separated. A successful democracy is composed of active, participating citizens. Education was especially necessary for the self-government of communities composed of immigrants and combinations of different languages, <coughs> cultures, and religious faiths. Education was essential for building the economic, political, social, and cultural foundation of the state and for establishing a homogeneity required for a unified nation. The success of the nation depended on grassroots education where decision-making authority was placed at the smallest level of social organization. According to Jefferson, every county should be divided into wards, and every ward should have its own school. The ward was seen as a small republic within itself. Jefferson feared a centralized control over education, which is what happened when the Federal Bureau of Education was established after the Civil War. Education was placed at the center of the state's understanding of government in the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 by John Adams. The diffusion of wisdom and knowledge among the general body of the people is necessary for the preservation of rights and liberties. It is the responsibility of legislators and magistrates to ensure public education. The Massachusetts Constitution inspired the Northwest Ordinance of 1785 which created a standardized system for Western settlement as far west as the Mississippi River. As there was no taxation by the federal government at the time, revenue raised through the sale of land was vital. In the ordinance, public education was placed at the center of the organization of territories. Every new town was required to set aside one-ninth of its land and one-third of its natural resources for the financial support of public education. A public school had to be placed at the center lot of every town. Following the Civil War, an estimated 200,000 one-room schoolhouses were built in rural areas under the oversight of the Federal Bureau of Education. An estimated 190,000 were in existence in 1919. Most one-room schoolhouses went out of use in the 1930s, mostly because of consolidation and the growth of better means of transportation, the car and the bus. Only about 400 active schoolhouses remain in the entire country. Next slide. My mother received her education in a one-room schoolhouse in upstate New York before attending Mount Holyoke College. In this painting, called the Oxbow, painted by Thomas Cole in 1835, also on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Mount Holyoke is in the foreground, looking toward the bend of the Connecticut River and Pioneer Valley in the background. The cultivated, sunny Arcadian landscape on the right represents American civilization pushing its way westward against the wild, uncultivated, stormy, and barbaric landscape on the left and the westward progress of civilization. Slide. Another important element of American democracy was Protestantism grassroots religion eschewing the glamorous Catholic cathedrals in favor of a door-to-door -door community based religion as promoted by Martin Luther. The Protestant ethic also plays an important role in the American work ethic. While the students in the one-room schoolhouse came from a variety of cultural and religious backgrounds, the one-room schoolhouse played a role in the Christianization of the citizens along with the development of Republican values. The architectural type for a Protestant church is a Greek Revival building with a steeple on top. The belfry and spire of the Catholic schoolhouse suggests the sequel from the 
Protestant Church. So, the precedent for all Protestant churches is important in the field of the Square of London, designed by James Gibbs in 1722. It is an Anglican church, so it was designed as an alternative to the Roman Catholic Church, just like all Protestant churches. Besides, the Victorian brackets supporting the shed roof hoods at the Catholic Schoolhouse represent another popular style of architecture in the United States at the end of the 19th century, Victorian or Gothic Revival or Carpenter Gothic. Slide. The most iconic work of the Carpenter Gothic is the Roach House in Bedford, designed by Alexander Jackson Davis in 1845. Davis collaborated with Andrew Jackson Downing on a number of publications celebrating the Carpenter Gothic, including Cottage Residences in 1842 and the Architecture of Country Houses in 1850. Carpenter Gothic houses are typically timber frame houses with elaborate ornamental detail, suggesting medieval ornament and connecting them to the Romantic Arts and Crafts movement, <coughs> celebrating the American Arcadia in an anti-industrial vernacular grassroots sediment promoting rural life, agriculture, education, and a democratic and egalitarian society. The ornamented timber frame houses are set in a picturesque landscape, a landscape designed to look wild and natural, which contrasts between different natural elements, again celebrating America as an Arcadian paradise. The Carpenter Gothic took advantage of the growing carpenter industry and an abundance of timber. Medieval stone details were carved in wood, as in the Greek Revival style, but more accurately this time with the invention of the steam-powered scroll saw, capable of creating jigsaw details in gingerbread patterns. Ironically, technology is used to protest against technology in the architecture. Downing believed that a well-designed home could be the basis for good citizenship and morality. Pride in the country is connected to pride at home. People can be better citizens if their homes symbolize values such as prosperity, education and patriotism. Knowledge of architecture of the fine arts should be cultivated for better morality and citizenship. Downing, who operated out of Newburgh, New York, on the Hudson River, died tragically in a steamboat accident at age 37. Downing is sometimes called the father of American landscape architecture. His protégés were Howard Fox and Frederick Law Olmsted. Their picturesque design for Central Park in New York was inspired by Downing. There are many great examples of Carpenter Gothic houses on Cape Cod and Martha Spinyard. Another important Gothic revival architect in the United States was Richard Upchon, who immigrated from England and became a very prominent architect. He was the founder and first president of the American Institute of Architects. Sorry. His Gothic revival designs were mostly for churches, such as Trinity Church in New York in 1839 but also for houses such as King's Boat in Newport here the same year. He is considered to have possibly introduced the Gothic Revival style in the United States. In England, the Gothic Revival style was anti-industrial, nationalistic, and Anglican. Right. Its leading spokesman was Augusti Wel Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin, who designed the Gothic details of the new Parliament building, Westminster Palace in London, in 1846, and the old one burned down. But in 1936, he published a book called Contrast, where he contrasted different types of buildings in the Gothic and modern industrial styles. The Gothic building was shown as warm, nurturing, reflecting cultural identity, and stimulating intellectual development. The modern industrial building was shown as cold and sterile, nurturing nothing and communicating nothing. Modern industrial building was a product of capitalist production systems and technological industrial advancements, which hit England especially hard, causing massive pollution and social problems, as portrayed in the novels of Charles Dickens. So I like, I like to tell this to architecture students as a professor. Next slide. There are many examples of modern architecture which seek to emulate the vernacular colonial Cape Cod style as representative of the roots of American society relating them to, to the Catalan schoolhouse. An early example is the White's residence in Des Moines, Iowa, which appeared on the cover.
Chicago architectural record in 1969. The house is a modernized version of the simple timber frame cake pot house with a fixed roof. Fine. The architect was John D. Bloodgood, my uncle. <laughs> Through his practice and as building editor for Better Homes and Gardens magazine, he specialized in house plan services, seeking to make high quality design widely available for homes. His model was everyone deserves to live in a house designed by an architect. He died in 2015. I would say the David probably knows, knew more about this architecture than anybody else I've ever met. Uh, slide. In 1979, Hugh Newell Jacobson designed a house for Jackie Onassis on Martha's Vineyard in the Cape Cod Shingle Stop. Hugh Jacobson became a very popular architect using world vernacular American architect agricultural typologies for luxurious residences. Sorry. He died earlier this year, but his son Simon now runs the office. Simon was a classmate of mine in architecture school. Robert Venturi, the famous postmodern architect, recreated the Cape Todd Shingle pitch roof house for a house on Block Island in 1979. Fine. And combined the shingle style with Greek revival details for a house in Claim Cove, Long Island in 1985. Postmodernism was a movement in architecture that involved a reintroduction of historical quotations and a syncretic design involving excessive ornamentation as a departure from the minimalism of modern architecture. The movement was a product of a society of excess production brought about by economic prosperity after World War II. Robert Stern also combined shingle style and Greek revival for a house on Buzzards Bay in 2007. At the time, Stern was the dean of the Yale School of Architecture. But <coughs> one more architect of note is David McLean of Katama, <laughs> former, <laughs> former professor of architecture at Roger Williams University. The residence on an o o ocean bluff in Pocasset is a single style cottage overlooking Buzzards Bay. It has minimalistic Greek revival details and a picturesque combination of different shingle patterns. Slide. The open interior allows for unobstructed views of the bay. I know, I've been there. And the detailing and craftsmanship are impeccable. Slide. The residence in Bourne combines the pitch roof and the shingles with dormer windows and bay windows, all American vernacular vocabulary elements with a triangular void in the pediment, reminiscent of my uncle's wife's residence. The Old Fellows Hall in Orleans was constructed as a schoolhouse in the 1850s. Renovation began in 2007. The pilasters on the corners, combined with the pitch, roof, and shingles, are reminiscent of the Catalan schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The house on Buzzards Bay, which we just visited this afternoon, Features overlapping shingles combined with trellis work and pitch roofs on the exterior and exposed rafters and wood trim on the interior. Slide on that slide. David's architecture combines vernacular traditions, arts and crafts traditions, colonial, cake pod, Greek revival, and even a hands of carpenter Gothic in an approach that celebrates American society, history, craft traditions, democracy, education, and grassroots rural life all of which are on display at the Catalan Schoolhouse. <laughs> Thank you. thought that 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 skirt was actually uh, all four corners curved out kind of pagoda style and others said no it's it's straight and do you think is there any uh, uh, any consistency anywhere that the, the skirt on the belfry would be sort of curved out pagoda style or you think
think maybe it was just straight? You just yeah, I don't know. I can't, I can't really tell from the slide that I don't know of any precedence in uh, you know, the website. Yeah. Casino and Newport. Casino and Newport has the same yeah. curve skirt. Yeah. So. Well, and that's probably correct then. Yeah. Uh, some, some of the Norman uh, belfries, uh, quadrilateral, will have a break and a skirt like that. I just want to mention very quickly that, that uh, a vestigial remnant of the Hudson chain with the swivel, as you probably know, was right outside the uh, the Redwood Library. It's, it used to be tied there for a long time. Uh, yeah. The great big chunks of steel. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah I've seen that. Yeah. Yes, I'm always commenting when my wife is probably telling me to be quiet, but the two doors, one for boys and one for girls, <laughs> is that something to do with religion? Puritanical. Uh, what? Puritanical. She said puritanical. So it has to do with re a religious Well, that's religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think exactly. yeah, pure, puritanism, the Protestant yeah. work ethic, you know, that's a big part of the roots of American democracy. I mean, yeah, there's been a separation of the sexes for you know, hundreds of years yeah. in European culture and early American culture. And uh, obviously, you know, equal rights for women is a very recent phenomenon in the history of human civilization. It's interesting, though, that they were walking through the doors and then coming into a common space. You know, yeah. <laughs> no, unless, unless they were divided by sea, maybe, or something yeah, like I'm that. I'm sure they were, but yeah. usually girls on one side of the room, boys on the other. Yeah, that's how it was here. They, uh, I think this was the boys' yard, and over there was the girls' side. And there was a fence separating, going right up the back in the middle. Um, yeah. So, so the boys got the larger side. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting also. But in the classroom, the students were uh, arranged by age in the classroom. Older kids, younger kids. I think they put the younger kids near the heat, and the older kids were on the other side. Was that two door arrangement common in all those other people? Yeah. You go up there once. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, my mom went to a one room school house and went on to be a physics major at Holyoke, so. Wow. I got a good education. Yeah. Her entire education was in one room? Entire education mm -hmm. one room in the yard. Wow. Oh. Oh. And my grandmother taught here in 1906, 1908. Wow. 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 Wow.